Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Al-Fatihah. Alhamdulillah bil alamin wa salatu wa salamu ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma ij'al jam'ana jam'an marhuma wa tafarruqana min ba'dihi tafarruqan ma'suma. Rabbana la tad'a lana min maqamina hadha illa dhanban dhanban illa ghafartah wa la hamman illa farajtah wa la karban illa naftah wa la wa la daynan illa qadaytah wa la maridan illa shafaytah wa la mubtala illa 'afaytah wa la dhalan illa hadaytah. Oh Allah We gather today to express gratitude upon your greatest gift toward us. In conjunction with this event, we ask for your help and guidance. Ya Allah, kindly give us strength and courage to face the struggle to find and gain knowledge. Kindly bestow blessing and physical and spiritual health, fitness of mind, peace of mind, strength and spirit. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah bil alamin. Taqabullahu minkum. Syukran jazilan kasiran al-fadhil ustaz for the dua recitation. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed with our session today, please join me to welcome yang berbahagia, Professor Muhammad Hashim Kamali, the founding CEO of IAIS Malaysia, to deliver his welcoming remark. Faliyata fadhal mashkura. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome everyone to IIS Malaysia. We are honored to have today our guest of honor, YB Senator Datu Raja Kamarul Bahrain Shah Ibn Raja Ahmad Badruddin Shah, uh, Deputy Minister of uh, uh, Housing in Rural Development. Uh, welcome to IIS Malaysia and thank you for gracing this occasion. The subject of our, <clears throat> let me also uh, mention how grateful we are to have uh, Your Excellency Mr. Pascal Grégoire, the Ambassador of Belgium to Malaysia, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Mohamed Azam, Mohamed Adil, Uh, Deputy CEO IS Malaysia, Haji Muhammad Azmi bin Abdul Hamid, uh, President Malaysian Consultative Council of Islamic Organization, MAPIM, uh, Dr. Muhammad Abdul Riza Alami, Director of Asia, uh, WE, and fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. Once again, uh, the subject of our gathering today, extremism creating divisions among the Muslim Ummah, problems and prospects. Some aspects of this uh, problem has become a matter of common knowledge. Uh, extremism, terrorism, radicalism, fundamentalism, has been so much in the headline that uh, it's no longer an unknown subject to the general public. And, uh, and the turbulent state of international relation uh, and the fact that uh, the terrorists have become entrenched, institutionalized, and have developed roots, they provide fodder to the problem and it becomes more difficult to uproot. Uh, they become a factor of divisiveness among the Ummah uh, because they run agendas that are unacceptable to the general public, to their own societies, and to the Muslim Ummah at large. They isolate themselves They take sides, uh, and they, uh, they become uh, part of movements and aspects of ac activities that people do not want to associate with. And therefore, there is division, because there is a division of the objectives 
in the, not the, the kind of the context of uh, engagement. They, are, uh, they make, a, these extremists make a bigger impact, usually than their size in numbers. Uh, they create bad news, and bad news you hit the mainstream media, and mainstream media is also problematic. Uh, <clears throat> often they also denounce people who do not join them. Uh, then that is everyone, every aspect of that becomes an aspect of division among people, among Muslims in the Ummah. Whereas Islam uh, teaches and advocates moderation, wasatiya, etidal, a balanced life, uh, they reject that. Islam advises uh, following the jama'ah, the majority society. But they isolate themselves. They take extremist positions, hardline extremism. You mentioned, for example, Boko Haram of Nigeria. They reject education. You mentioned of Taliban and Al Shabaab. They also reject either female education or education generally. So they cannot gain acceptance for these kind of agendas and objectives from the general ummah. The Taliban of Afghanistan, they have become so violent, there is hardly a week they do not kill innocent people. Uh, they have, they had an objective that people understood and they still have. They want to uh, the Americans to leave Afghanistan, the foreigners to leave Afghanistan. That is something that they strike a note of what people like, and therefore they do become influential. This aspect, you might say, it, it causes divisiveness, but also they find ways of uh, making themselves closer to people. They are influential in villages and districts far away in Aspen places of Afghanistan. And <coughs> their sources of, uh, <coughs> of support and finance, they are engaged in, uh, in drug dealing, international drug trafficking. That is the main source of their, uh, their income. But since they have become uh, now uh, institutionalized more or less, uh, partly because of the murky international politics, any of the neighboring countries of Afghanistan who want to oppose the Americans, uh, who want to do something to um, <clears throat> uh, against the Americans, uh, then uh, they, uh, they, uh, they strike Afghanistan. Like, uh, they find some ways of colluding with the Taliban uh, against the general society. For example, the Russians, the Pakistanis, and they uh, support the Taliban because the Taliban are against the Americans. So you find that this international politics becomes another factor, how the extremists and fundamentalism become, uh, become a greater presence. And they cause uh, loss of life, misery, and uh, degradation. Uh, they... Uh, uh, they mingle with people, and uh, sometimes they force people to give them support. And they don't have effective means uh, to do anything against. Um, 
The Taliban, for example, in Afghanistan, they also go to the remote places and they, some of the mines, lapis lazuli mines, they usurp them and they extract them and throw the government forces out or whoever, it, and that becomes their source of uh, another financial uh, means of support. So you find that their, uh, the evil deeds of uh, these groups is not confined to plain violence. They corrupt society. They've spread corruption in so many different ways. And they divide the Ummah, uh, not in just one way, but in many different ways. I hope that uh, we will have a fruitful discussion. There are learned speakers among us that uh, will look into aspects of how these problems grow and uh, what are, if there are any way, ways that the general public can do. Unfortunately, the general public, because it is moderate, because on the side of, uh, you know, the gentle ways of doing, they do not, they are not violent enough to give them an effective kickback. Uh, and uh, there must be other ways that they can, the, the society can do to protect themselves against the evil of these extremism. Without taking any further time, I hope that we will uh, have an educa educational and enlightening session today. Assalamu alaikum. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me now to invite Yang Berhormat Senator Datuk Raja Kamarul Bahrain Shah Ibn Raja Ahmad Baharudin Shah to the stage to deliver his welcoming speech and officiate our seminar today. Faliya tafadzal mashkura. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashraf anbir salin. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Mr. Chairman, Professor Dr. Muhammad Hashim Kamali, founding CEO of JAIS, His Excellency the Ambassador of Belgium, Mr. Pascal Gregory, Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Azam, Deputy CEO of IAS, Dr. Abdul Reza, Director of Asia West East Center, Datuk Wira Abdul Ghani Shamsuddin, so Tuan Haji Muhammad Azmi Abdul Hamid as President of MAPIN, ladies and gentlemen, fellow guests and members of the media. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we are here gathered today and I would like to Congratulate the organizers for organizing this very timely and appropriate seminar where there is a need for the Muslim countries to come together and unite. The issues confronting the Ummah in the 21st century is unprecedented. Not only are the challenges before the Muslim Ummah related to factors from external sources, but more critical are factors from within ourselves. With the current predicament, Facing millions of Muslims, we are facing a very crucial moment in the history of the Muslim world. Divisions or disunity is the most serious predicament facing the Ummah in the current century. The reality is too glaring. Muslims are subjected to intense oppression and denial of the basic rights that in some cases are of prosecution and the lives of the Muslims are at the lowest level. The dignity of the Muslims are under attack with no signs that the respects of the Muslims will be restored. This is most unfortunate. With the excellence of the Islamic civilization achieved for centuries, we are now witnessing the decadence of the Ummah in virtually all aspects of development. Indeed, the Ummah were once the leaders of enlightenment of knowledge. We are now the slaves of the Western world. Extremism has been the discourse 
that has dominated the debate at the international forums. And much more are the debates on religious extremism. Not, notwithstanding, that extremism cannot be associated to only one religion. It is the trend of the debate today by design that Muslims are targeted as a subject of extremism. While it is a fact that extremism has normally been associated with racism, religious extremism has been perceived as a distortion of the teachings of a particular religion. It is most unfortunate reality that while Islam is the fastest growing religion on earth since September 11, the Islam of moderation and mercy that we know is overwhelmed with the narrative of Islam that is seen as a harsh and uncompromising religion. It must be noted, while extreme individual action cannot be extrapolated to be the description of the religion of Islam, yet the normal perception will always be correlated with it. This is not a coincidence. It is, in fact, a deliberate narrative to put Islam in a bad image. This is where, in general, the world media plays a huge part in creating the perceptions. Perhaps recently what Tone Dr. Mahathir, our Prime Minister, put forward to have a joint Muslim media station to counter the negative perceptions of the Muslim communities is something worth exploring. Few countries, including Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, together Malaysia, has agreed in principle to look into the establishment of this media to counter the propaganda which is very much aimed at the Muslim Ummah. We must position the debate of extremism in the proper perspective. On one hand, it can be related to an individual endeavor rooted in his or her understanding of Islam, either through the indoctrination or otherwise. On the other hand, the act of extremism may also be an outcome of a condition that is imposed unjustly on a subject that created an extreme reaction. The Muslim Ummah has been targeted subject of relentless attacks through a design narrative depicting Muslims as dangerous and potentially aggressive. By giving a description of incidences of violence supposedly done by Muslims only, labeling Muslims terrorists or Muslim militants have been the jargon of language normally used in the media. This is in spite of the continuing victimization of Muslims all over the world. Yet, the victims are turned to be labeled as terrorists. That is where we see that the Muslim TV media grouping would help to clarify the general perception that is very imbalanced today. Victims of injustice have been the plight of many Muslims around the world. It looks like it is convenient to subject any Muslim to be labelled as extremist, while little attention is given to the root cause of why an extreme reaction is sorted to as a way of expression by someone who is in a state of desperation. The fact that hegemonic agenda by world superpowers have always titled the balance of justice to be more in favour of the elite with authority and wealth the marginalized majority are left to suffer the consequences of oppression and the inability to fight for their basic rights, which are denied under the pretext of democracy. As we all know, extremism has indeed made a serious dent on the image of the Ummah. Not only Islam has been perceived as an aggressive religion, it has also been distorted as a religion of violence. The popular debate on Islamophobia has not only made it into an intellectual discourse, but has been adopted in national policies, especially with certain Western powers. However, it should be emphasized that the Muslim Ummah must be conscious of the vulnerability of being easily maneuvered by forces that want to tarnish the image of Islam. The media onslaught that portray Muslim as aggressive and inclined to violence are breaking news that is always scooped in the media as headlines. The propaganda that extremism will always be associated with Islam is often intentional. Ladies and gentlemen, 
What the Muslim Ummah needs to endeavor is to revert to the true meaning of Islam. The Ummah cannot be allowed to expose itself to a distorted version of the religion while claiming that Islam is a religion that promotes moderation, peace, and simplicity. The Ummah is in need of a true stewardship that will guide Muslims to become the exemplary people of Islam. The practice of Islam as enshrined in the Quran and the guidance of the Sunnah should be the point of reference. A distraction from this will be the source of deviation and ultimately extremist behavior. As we all know, the debate on addressing and combating extremist groups the likes of Daesh, ISIS, Boko Haram, Abu Sayyaf, Shabab needs a persistent effort to unravel the root cause of their existence. The world community needs to admit the hard truth that aggression by powers that be should also be exposed. Situation of anarchy in the Middle East, particularly in Syria, has put Muslims in a bad light as we see to be yeah? We seem to be fighting among ourselves for no apparent strong reason. The world media are happy to supply the news and the superpowers are only too happy to supply arms and ammunition to fuel the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. Moving closer to home, I would like to touch on perhaps there's going to be a paper this afternoon on the topic of the Reality of Takfirism in Contemporary Malaysia by Dr. Ahmad Fauzi, which I would just like to pass a remark on what has transpired in Malaysia as far back as 1980s, where there were certain events that have made situation among the Muslim communities very uneasy. In Malaysia in 1980s, the situation in the Malay and Lashi Muslim dominant East Coast was such that congregation players were held separately by those subscribing to the particular teachings of certain groups. Thus, we saw the sad and tragic two imam prayers being conducted in those conservative communities. This is a most unfortunate development in Malaysia. And even meals prepared from certain groups are not willingly accepted by other Muslims due to certain reasons. The Muslim community in Malaysia were thus deeply divided and even until today, the effect is still very much evident and is remembered by many. Although the 1980s saw a very sad and dark chapter in Malaysian Muslim society in terms of division, we thought that we should learn from it. Sadly, as recently as a few years ago, in 2016-2017, there were sermons held in mosques and surahs, certain states of peninsula declaring halal dara, or permissible to kill certain groups of people for certain so-called offenses against Islam. This is a very, very sad development in Malaysia. There were also calls for certain categories of people to be eliminated, or in Malay, wajib dihapuskan, through religious sermons delivered. Although there were reports to the law enforcement bodies in 2016-2017, these were even brought up in Parliament, no actions were taken. We hope we will have to deal with these issues more positively and in a more aggressive way in order to arrest the spread of such belief and such call for extremism. This creates the perception that certain authorities are in agreement and condemn such harsh stance when certain Officials in the government do not have enough courage to speak up against such movement. This is perhaps going to be addressed in detail this afternoon on the situation in Malaysia. But perhaps this is something that we in Malaysia should take it seriously before the situations get out of hand. The recent extreme action by a superpower that has installed thousands of military troops in the Middle East and launched a drone attack to certain areas and to execute an assassination with impunity on a prominent leader of a state cannot be agreed as an act of not only extremism, but also it should be categorized as an act of war crimes. This was 
created and was enacted in a third country where the superpowers do not have such right or jurisdiction to take such action. The creation of an excuse to launch such an attack cannot be accepted under the excuse of self-defense. It was a state-sponsored terrorism and extremism of the highest order. So this is how we should put things into perspectives that there are others who clearly violate the human rights and also the international law. It is here today that we are gathered and we hope that this effort of a continuous discourse on extremism will ultimately enlighten the public about the need to resort back to Islam in its true essence. I hope the discussions will be fruitful and will impact on the public debate in the hope of finding a path for Ummah unity and world peace. And I hope everyone will have a very fruitful day of discussion and enlightenment and shall we all be enriched by today's session. With that, I hereby humbly open officially the second seminar on Muslim extremists creating divisions in the Muslim Ummah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism and Hinduism have been exploited to provide the motivation for public violence. An extremist mindset does not happen overnight, but due to various factors and the fertile environment that make it grow. This is therefore, it is very important to honestly identify the factors and the nature of the environment that enable the peaceful and spiritual teaching of Islam to be radicalized. Thus, IAIS Malaysia take the lead to comment this year 2020 to discuss and deliberate this important issue. Without further ado, Ado, I would like to invite Dr. Muhammad Azam Muhammad Adil, the Deputy CEO of IAIS Malaysia, to the stage to moderate the session, uh, followed, followed by our distinguished speakers, Yang Berbahagia Dr. Muhammad Hassan Zamani, lecturer at Al Mustafa University of Iran, Yang Berbahagia Datuk Wira Abdul Ghani Samsudin, the Director of Shura Malaysia, and Associate Prof Professor Dr. Daniel bin Muhammad Yusuf, Principal Researcher at Extremism Analytical Unit, Research Unit, IRU, of ISTAC IAUM, to the stage. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, yang berhormat, Senator Datuk Raja Kamarul Bahrain, Shah Ibn. Ibni Raja Ahmad Bahadurin Shah, Deputy Minister Housing and Local Developments, Professor Hashim Kamali, founding CEO of West Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, we are indeed honoured to have this uh, seminar, the second seminar on this Muslim extremists creating divisions in the Muslim Ummah, problems and prospects, uh, collaborated with ASEAWI, MAPIM and SHURA. And I think this is the second event that we collaborate with ASEAWI on this important agenda and topic. Uh, for the first session this morning, we'll be having the three speakers will be sharing their thoughts on the specific topics which are listed in the program. Uh, and I think what is important here is today, Muslim extremists are one of the most important challenges of the Muslim world. Providing a dogmatic and rejected reading of Islam and considering their own reading as the only correct one, they reject the other sects of Islam by violence from the circle of Islam. And uh, having a few uh, words from YB itself just now, how he described some of the practices and experiences that we have in Malaysia those days, which is not really the true teaching of Islam. And we hope that that practice does not occur and take place anymore right now. Given the new ideas in the field of the international relations, 
which attach particular status and functions to region and the qualitative and content categories such as identity and culture, the harmful effects of takfiri groups in the international arena for the Muslim world can be seen in the decline of the power in the world and the creation of a security challenge for the Muslim world, which undermines the security of the Muslim regions. In addition, although the new conditions in the international arena lead to the non-governmental actions such as the Muslim Ummah, the divergent nature of takfiri groups, on the other hand, causes a decline in the international action and on the other hand, undermines the idea of the Muslim Ummah. Based on the current situation, the role of Islamic enlighteners and scholars of Islam to enlighten the genuine Islam, prevent further deviations and divisions and create a ground for unity among Muslim Ummah is much prominent and necessary. This one day seminar will try to answer these questions, the following questions, by inviting the Malay regional and also uh, speakers from Iran and also media activists. First, how do extremist groups affect the unity of the Muslim Ummah? What is the negative and destructive role of, the ex of extremist groups in the unity of the Muslim world at the international level? And finally, examining the origins of the extremist groups and their supporters. With that, for this session, we will be having the three speakers. First, we'll be inviting uh, Dr. Muhammad Hassan Zamani, who is a lecturer and researcher from Al Mustafa University in Iran. That will be uh, talking on in investigating the ways of overcoming takfir crisis and modeling the ideal Islamic society. Followed later by uh, Yang Berbahagia Datuk Wira Abdul Ghani Shamsuddin, who will be talking on combating extremism and terrorism, the Islamic approach. And last but not least, for the morning session, Associate Professor Dr. Daniel bin Muhammad Yusuf will be talking on track of violent extremism in the digital age. With that, I pass the mic to Dr. Zamani first. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina, Sayyid al Anbiya, Muhammad al Amin, wa ala Alihi al Athar, wa Sahbihi al Akhyar. Awalan Ashkurullah Tabarak wa Ta'ala ala anna Allah manna alayya wa wafagani li safar al Thalith ila balad Malizia, adha al balad al Islam ya Shagheer. Al safar al Awal, kabla thamaniyat ashar sana. الجامعات الماليزية دعتني للمشاركة في المؤتمر العالمي للأديان والسفر الثاني قبل أربع سنة شاركت هنا في مؤتمر الاستشراق وألغيت مهاضرة هنا وهذا السفر الصالث جئت من الجمهورية الإسلامية الإيرانية مع صديقي وزميلي فضيلة الشيخ إمام الجمعة لأهل السنة من الشافعية الشيخ مصطفى خاتمي و الحمد لله ونشكركم أيضا لحسن الضيافة شعبا وحكومة وجامعية و Excuse me on speak Arabic and uh, Dr. Ali translate to English in PowerPoint إن الإسلام هو دين السلم والرحمة والمحبة والآمن للخشونة والتشدد والإرهاب والتكفير والقتل وإن جوهرة الرحمة تبلورت في أناصر كثيرة من تعاليم الشريعة الإسلامية منها أن اسم الإسلام اتخذ من السلم والإيمان مأخوذ من الآمن وأن الله هو الرحمن الرحيم والرحمة الإلهية تشمل المحسنين بالثواب المضاعف كما تشمل المسيئين بالمغفرة والرحمة والنبي الكريم كان بالمؤمنين رؤوفا رحيما وبالمشركين كادها نفسه أن لا يكونوا مؤمنين وعلى هذا فإن فكرة التكفير 
المشتملة على تكفير المسلمين وقتلهم والتشدد على غير المسلمين وذبههم وتدمير بلادهم لا صلة له بالشريعة الإسلامية وكل ما تشبثوا به من الآيات والأحاديث لا صلة لها بالتكفير وما عرفوا وما عرفوا معناها أقدم بحثي ودراستي في خمسة محاور المهور الأول إذا درسنا جميع الأديان والملل والنهل في العالم فلا نجد دينا مركزا على الرحمة والمحبة أكثر من شريعة الإسلام فإن روح الإسلام هو الرحمة هذه الروحية وجوهرة الرحمة تتبلور في عناصر متعددة من المعارف الإسلامية وهذه العناصر كثيرة نسرد خمسة منها الأول كلمة الإسلام سميت هذه الشريعة بالإسلام لتدل على أن هذه الشريعة ليست حقيقتها إلا السلم والرحمة كما قال الله تبارك وتعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا ادخلوا في السلم كافة وكما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم المسلم من سلم المسلمون من لسانه ويده الكلمة الثانية الإيمان والإيمان من الأمن فكل من يؤمن بالله يجب أن يكون إباد الله في أمان منه الثالث كلمة الرحمن والرحيم من أعظم الصفات الذي وصف الله نفسه بها في البسملة وفي أول آية من كتابه العزيز وأكد عليه في سورة فاتحة الكتاب هو الرحمة بنوعيها الرحمة العامة والخاصة فقال بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واسم الرحمن يبين رحمته العامة لجميع الأشياء من الأرض والسماء والشمس والغمر والزهور والفواكه والشجر والبشر والفلك والملك والمسلم والكافر واسم الرحيم يبين رحمته الخاصة لأنبيائه وأوليائه ومن أتاءه في عوامره ونواهيه كما قال الله تبارك وتعالى في قرآنه ورحمتي وسعت كل شيء وكل مسلم مكلف بالتخلق بأخلاق الله كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم تخلقوا بأخلاق الله الرابع إن الله عادل أضاف عدالته ورحمته الخاصة لأعمال إباده في مجالين المجال الأول أنه يجازي العمل الصالح بعشرة أضعاف ولا يجاز السيئة إلا بمثلها فقال من جاء بالحسنة فله عشر أمثالها ومن جاء بالسيئة فلا يجزى إلا مثلها المجال الثاني إنه أوعد المسيئين الجزاء وهم مستحقون للنار ولكنه تعالى اقتضت حكمته أن تشمل رحمته جميع المسيئين بأن لا يغنى أحد من رحمة الله وقال قل يا إبادي الذين أصرفوا على أنفسهم لا تغنتوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا الخامس إن أشرف الخلق هو النبي الأكرم محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فهو كان سيد ولد آدم وأشرف الأنبياء وقدوة الأولياء وقال وإنك لعلى خلق عظيم وقال فبما رحمة من الله لنت لهم ولو كنت فضا غليظ القلب لانفضوا من هولك وبدل أن يغضب النبي على المهاجمين المنهرفين ويدعو عليهم بنزول العذاب والدمار دعا لهم بالعفو والغفران وقال اللهم اغفر قومي فإنهم لا يعلمون وقال لعلك باخع نفسك أن لا يكونوا مؤمنين وقال لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة فينبغي أن يختدي به جميع الأمة سيما المسلمون المعاصرون والفرق المتطرفة الذين يدعون أنهم يريدون أن يهيوا سنة النبي الرحمة السادس 
إن شريعة الإسلام تكون شريعة الرحمة لا للمسلمين والمؤتنقين به فقط بل للكفار أيضا وجميع العالمين وقال تعالى وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين ولذلك شرع الله القسط والبر لغير المسلمين من أتباع سائر الأديان الذين لا يهاربون الإسلام ولا يقاتلون الأمة الإسلامية على الدين ولا يخرجون المسلمين من أراضيهم وأوطانهم فقال لا ينهاكم الله أن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم هذه هي الشريعة الإسلامية والرحمة المفروضة على المسلمين لغير المسلمين فسبحان الله نرى فرغة ينتمون إلى شريعة الرحمة ولا يترحمون على إخوانهم في الدين ولا يبرون ولا يخسطون إليهم نعم ربما يبرون على الكفار ويتدوددون بالدول الاستعمارية الغربية والكيان الغاصب الصهيوني الذين يغاتلون المسلمين في الدين وأخرجوا الملايين من المسلمين الفلسطينيين من ديارهم فيأخذون الأسلحة المهدادة مهدات المتبرعة من أمريكا ويتعاونون الصهاينة المجرمين في تداوي جرهاهم إلى غير ذلك ولا يترحمون المسلمين ألا يكون عجبا أن فرق متطرفة تكفيرية مسلمة يكون عندهم الكفار في بلادنا آمنين ويكون المسلمون وإخوانهم في الدين منهم خائفين المهبر الثاني إن الله تبارك وتعالى فتح باب الدخول إلى الإسلام وجعل الباب وسيعا وجعل باب الخروج عن الإسلام ضيقا رحمة من الرحمن الرحيم إلى إباده الأثيم توضيح ذلك اتفق علماء الأمة من جميع المذاهب الإسلامية على كفاية إظهار الشهادتين لسيرورة الإسلام إنسان مسلم فيصير مهترما دمه وإرضه وماله وهذا ما تعلم علماء الدين من آيات الوحي الإلهي حيث ما جاء عدد من الأعراب وادعوا أنهم آمنوا بالإسلام وبنبوة محمد صلى الله ما أن الله كان عالما بأنهم لم يؤمنوا في قلوبهم بالتوحيد ولا بنبوة محمد فأنزل الله جبرائيل ومنعهم عن ادعاء الإيمان ولكن قبل منهم إسلامهم ودخولهم في الأمة الإسلامية وهذا بمجرد إظهارهم قبول الإسلام ما عدم إيمانهم القلبي فنزلت هذه الآية الشريفة قالت الأعراب آمنا قل لم تؤمنوا ولكن قولوا أسلمنا ولما يدخل الإيمان في قلوبكم فعلى أساس هذه الآية الكريمة يجب أن نعترف بأن كل من يظهر الشهادتين في العالم ويدعي الإسلام في كرة الأرض من جميع المذاهب والفرق الإسلامية يكون مسلما وداخلا في الأمة الإسلامية ولا يجوز لنا أن نخرجه عن أمة الإسلام وننسب إليه الكفر حتى لو فرضنا أن بعضهم لا يعتقدون في قلوبهم بالإسلام نعم كلهم مسلمون ومؤمنون كما في الحديث الشريفة عن أصامة بن زيد قال بعثنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في سرية فسبحنا من الهرغات كما تعلمون إذا كان مجرد إظهار الشهادتين كافيا لكون الإنسان مسلما مؤمنا داخلا في الأمة الإسلامية مهترما دمه وإرضه وماله فلا يؤثر شيء ما دون ذلك في إخراجه من الأمة الإسلامية ونسبة الكفر إليه فكيف يكون الخلاف العلمي الاجتهادي في بعض الأحكام من الأحكام الشرعية أو فروع الأقائد مع التزام المسلم بكل ما ثبتت إسلاميته مخرجا إياه عن أمة الإسلام ومسبقا لنسبة الكفر إليه المهبر الثالث 
بعض الفرق التكفيرية يستدلون على إفرادهم في تكفير المسلمين بعدلة ينبغي الإجابة عنها الأول إطلاق كلمة الكفر على بعض الأعمال في القرآن والسنة وقالوا إن هو يقول يدل على أن مرتكبه كافر وخارج عن ملة الإسلام فيسير دمه وإرضه وماله مباها مثل ومن لم يحكم بما أنزل الله فأولئك هم الكافرون ومن هلف بغير الله فقد كفر وأشرك والجواب أن نعم كلمة الكفر استعملت في النصوص على أعمال متعددة ولكنهم غافلون عن أن كلمة الكفر لها معاني متفاوتة فالكفر قد يكون واجبا فمن يكفر بالتاغوت هو كفر التاغوت وقد يكون مصطحبا وهو الزراعة وكمثل غيث أعجب الكفار نباته وقد يكون بمعنى كفران النعمة وقد يكون معصية دون الخروج عن الدين ونعم وقد يكون الكفر المخرج عن الدين لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله ثالث ثلاثة المهبر الرابع استدل بعض التكفيريين على جواز تكفير كثير من المسلمين بأن اعتقاد بعض المسلمين ببعض العقائد الباطلة الفرعية يستلزم اعتقادهم بعدم قبول القرآن وقال أيضا إن التكفيريين والدائش والوهابية كفروا أكثر المسلمين من شتى المذاهب والفرق واستدلوا بأدلة واهية منها إن التكفيريين ودائش أفتوا بكفر جميع أتباع الطرق السوفية وأنتم تعلمون أن عدد أتباع الطرق السوفية في العالم الإسلامي يبلغ أكثر من نصف مليارد في الأمة الإسلامية والثاني أفتى مفتي داعش بأن الشافعيين كفار خارجون عن ملة الإسلام والثالث إن داعش حينما دخل العراق فبدأوا بقتل السنة والشيعة فقتلوا من أهل السنة أكثر من الشيعة وكانت نسبة شهداء أهل السنة في العراق خمسة وسبعون بالمئة الذين قتلهم الدائشيون والرابع إن عدد القتلى من الأمة الإسلامية بأيد التكفيريين في الأشر الأخير أكثر من جميع المقتولين بأيد التكفيريين في جميع تاريخ الإسلام فعدد المقتولين المسلمين في العراق الذين قتلهم الدائش أكثر من مليون مسلم ويقال إن عدد المقتولين من الأمة الإسلامية في العراق وسوريا ونيجيريا ويمن وغير وغير من البلاد الإسلامية بالمؤامرة الأمريكية في العشر الأخير يبلغ عدد المقتولين المسلمين إلى ثمانية عشر مليون مسلم ولا نرى هذا العدد الهائل من المقتولين من الأمة الإسلامية في ألف سنة من تاريخ الإسلام ومنها إن التيارات التكفيرية والدائش حينما ذبحوا المسلمين وأطفالهم وسبوا نساءهم وأسسوا مجازر للأمة الإسلامية وأهرقوا النصارى باسم الإسلام شبه سورة الإسلام في العالم والأخير أن بعض الشباب المنخدئين من داعش حينما رجعوا بعد هزيمة داعش إلى البلاد الإسلامية إلى إيران وإلى إراق وإلى ماليزيا وإلى أندونيسيا وإلى نيجيريا رجعوا إلى بلادهم الإسلامية وغير إسلامية ليستمروا الجهاد ضد الكفار على رأيهم الباطل رجاء أربعة منهم إلى إيران أربعة منهم رجعوا إلى إيران 
و الى حدود بلادنا و بدأوا بالجهاد و القتل و التفجيرات ففي اول عملياتهم قتلوا مفت الشافعي في ایران فضيلة الشيخ العالم الشهيد السيد محمد شيخ الاسلام رحمة الله عليه حينما كان هذا الشيخ المفتي صائما في شهر رمضان كان في المسجد فبعد أن فرغ من صلاة المغرب قتله هؤلاء الشباب الدائشيون وفروا وبعد أن أن أخذهم هراس الثورة ودعوا علماء الأمة ليتكلموهم ذهبت وتكلمت مع القاتل الدائشي الذي قتل مفت الشافعية أنا تكلمت معه وقلت فضيلة الأخ لماذا قتلت هذا الشيخ العالم الزاهد العالم الكبير مفت الشافعية لماذا قتلته فأجاب لأنه كافر سألته كيف هو صار كافرا قال لأنه على بدعة الشافعية ولم يكن وحابيا فقلت هل الشافعيين كلهم كفرة قال نعم كل شافعيين قلت لماذا ابتدعت بقتل هذا الشيخ إمام الجمعة قال لأن القرآن أمرنا بأن نبتدئ بقتل أئمة الجمعة قلت في أي آية من القرآن الكريم قال إن الله تبارك وتعالى قال بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقاتلوا أئمة الكفر والمراد من أئمة الكفر أئمة الجمعة والجماعات من الشافعية والشيعة والمالكية والهنفية هذا رأيهم هذا رأي الدائشين والتكفيرين بالنسبة إلى علماء الأمة هذه فتنة كبيرة ويجب علينا كعلماء ومثقفين والجامعيين أن نحاول ونطابع هذه المحاولة لحل ومعالجة هذه المشكلة بأون الله تبارك وتعالى والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته دكتور زماني أمين you have Uh, shared with you quite a number of important points despite I was uh, I mean disturbed with some conversation with the other speakers but I found it very important because you, in in your in your points some of your points you mentioned about this this division of this mazhab and not only um, among Sunni and Shi'is that has divided us but also within the Sunni group also have that and the takfiri Uh, to 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 label others people to other peoples which are which do not share your same view or your same thought, somehow this group of people will label the other party as as infidel or what we call it kafir, and this is a very dangerous uh, phenomenon. Uh, with that, uh, uh, for for those who missed the presentation just now, I mean there were slide there was a slide that shared. Uh, maybe there was not tally. Some, the, the slide was the important point of the presentation, but Alhamdulillah, uh, we'll be sharing the slides on our website once we finish the seminar today. Uh, for the first uh, session, the three panelists, the three speakers have agreed to, uh, for us to share the slide. I hope for the rest of the speakers in the afternoon, so uh, they also perhaps willing for us to share the set for others. Okay, for the second speaker, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Wira Abdul Ghani Shamsuddin. He will be sharing uh, with us uh, the combating extremism and tourism the Islamic approach in Bahasa Melayu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wassalam ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man nasarahu wa wala, yang mulia, yang kita kasihi, Uh, uh, pengurusi uh, IAAS uh, IAIS uh, Profesor Hashim Kamali selaku tuan rumah yang kita hormati Saudara Dr. Reda uh, selaku pengurusi 
uh, pertubuhan uh, yang menganjur ini juga <coughs> uh, Presiden MAPIM Cikgu Azmi uh, dan uh, pimpinan Syura dan seluruh uh, tetamu dan uh, penyampai kertas uh, kerja ataupun wacana pada pagi ini daripada uh, Iran, daripada Malaysia uh, dan juga uh, duta Belgium yang kita kasihi dan tak lupa uh, Datuk Raja Bahrain, Timbalan Menteri kita yang ada bersama kita Tuan-tuan uh, sekalian, maafkan saya bercakap dalam bahasa Melayu untuk meng mengabadikan Melayu, bahasa Melayu <laughs> eh tuan-tuan pun sekalian, kalau saya bahasa Arab nanti mungkin ramai tak faham juga <laughs> Ya. Jadi tentu amat sekalian uh, <coughs> perkara yang ingin saya sampaikan secara ringkas saja sebenarnya adalah Bencana sifat hulu dan ekstremisme dalam masyarakat Kita mulakan dengan uh, uh, memetik firman Allah SWT dalam surah An-Nisa ayat 171 Ya ahlal kitab la taglu fi dinikum wa la taqulu ala Allah illa al-haq ini ayat ini menjelas menyentuh tajuk iaitu al-ghulu ya ataupun melampau berlebih-lebihan ya ya oh hai ahli kitab janganlah kalian bersifat ghulu dalam agama kalian dan jangan kalian berkata melai tentang Allah kecuali yang benar ya. seterusnya adalah surah al-maidah ayat 77 juga Konteksnya sama iaitu Kul ya ahlal kitab La taglu fi dinikum Ghairal haq Wala tattabi'u Ahwa'a qawmin Qaddallu min qabl Wa adallu kathira Wa dallu An sawa'is sabil Hai ahlal kitab Jangan kalian bersikap Hulu dalam agama Kecuali menyampaikan yang benar Dan jangan kalian Mengikut hawa nafsu Golongan yang telah sesat sebelum ini Dan mereka menyesatkan ramai orang Bahkan mereka sendiri memang sungguh sesat Dari jalan yang benar ya. Jadi tuan-tuan dan sekalian Kita jadikan ayat ini sebagai ya, Mukadimah ya, Untuk kita uh, meneruskan Kuraian kita tentang tajuk kita Pertama tentunya kita nak faham pengertian al-ghulu. Al-ghulu sifat ekstremisme yakni sifat melampau adalah sifat yang tidak disukai oleh Islam. Kerana Islam menolak kecurigaan tidak berasas. Tuduhan melulu. Keangkuhan dan perbuatan mencemuh orang lain melampau keterlaluan tanatok juga dalam bahasa Arab tanatok iaitu sifat membicarakan hal titik bengik dan sikap tashadud sikap keras dan ini berlandaskan ayat-ayat yang telah kita bacakan di samping hadis Rasulullah SAW Riwayat Ibn Abbas bahawa Rasulullah SAW bersabda Iyakum wal gulu fid din Fa innama halaka man kana qablakum Bil gulu wi fid din Awas kalian dari bersikap gulu Melampau dalam beragama Kerana sesungguhnya orang sebelum kamu telah celaka Kerana mereka melampau dalam agama Jadi tuan-tuan bahas kalian Itu adalah penjelasan Rasulullah SAW Dan maksud uh, Hulu itu Maaf uh, Maksud Hulu ya, Dapat kita lihat Dalam berbagai uraian Pertamanya ulama umumnya sepakat Menyebutkan bahawa Hulu ialah Al-mujawazah atau mujawazatul hudud syar'iyah melampaui batasan syarak. Menurut Sheikh bin Bas, 
الزيادة في الدين على جهل على جهل يظنه دينا وليس بدين يأتو سواتو توكوك تامح dalam agama dengan kerana kejahilan dan menganggapnya sebagai agama padahal perkara berkenaan bukan agama agama bukan parti politik itu saya jelas kalau kita mempolitikkan atau menjadikan parti sebagai agama keluar parti kafirlah seseorang itu ya Rasulullah bersabda halakal mutanatti'un halakal mutanatti'un halakal mutanatti'un ya tiga kali yang bermaksud celakalah mereka yang melampau dan bersikap yoyoh ya Menurut Al-Qaradawi, perkara ini boleh disimpulkan sebagai berikut. Eh, merangkum gejala berikut. Kita ambil pandangan presiden ulama sedunia. Ya. Dia kata pertama, dia merangkum ta'asub dengan pendapat sendiri. Ya, fanatik dengan pendapat sendiri tanpa menghormati pandangan orang lain yang berbeza. Fanatik terhadap pendapat sendiri. Yang kedua mewajibkan masa umat kalangan umat dengan sesuatu yang tidak diwajibkan oleh Allah. Itu yang kedua maknanya. Yang ketiga bersikap keras tidak bertempat atau salah tempat. Keras salah tempat. Keempat sikap tegar melampau dan bengkeng. Ya, melampau dan bengkeng. Ha, ini bahasa bahasa Kelantan kan. <laughs> Tapi bahasa Melaka yang bengkeng ni. Bengkeng ni tuan nak berkelahi sajalah. Ya. Yeah. Suara keras ya. Yeah. Saya tak tahu Kelantan pun bengkeng ya. Okey. Ha, sikap tegar melampau dan bengkeng. Yang kelima, buruk sangka terhadap orang lain. Orang lain mesti kafir, orang lain masuk neraka. Yang masuk syurga dia seorang. Dia dan kumpulan dia. Nah, ini masalah. Ini itu disebut hulu. Eh? Yang keenam terjebak dalam budaya kafir mengkafir. Ah itu puncak dia tu dan lain-lain. Jadi selesa sekalian itu ya huraiannya dan menurut Sheikh Abu Hasan An Nadawi uh, menang uh, memang tidak diragukan lagi. Bahawa gejala melampau, ekstremism, hulu, sifat beku dan sebagainya memang wujud dan suatu realiti. Itu mana yang telah disebutkan oleh sahabat kita daripada Iran tadi. Ya. Namun untuk mengaitkannya dengan seseorang atau kumpulan atau situasi tertentu atau jalur pemikiran tertentu memerlukan kepada sikap adil dan pertimbangan yang halus. Ya, teliti dan tuntas bukan semeronoan ya, bukan semeronoan <tuh> yang menyerlahkan watak dan sifat hulu ni apakah faktor-fakturnya ya. dia disebabkan oleh banyak faktor antaranya yang merujuk kepada aspek ilmu atau lebih tepat kejahilan tentang Al-Quran kejahilan tentang makasid syariah ya Kejahilan tentang makasih syariah yang uh, umumnya boleh kita simpulkan ya, sebagai kejahilan terhadap Al-Quran, kejahilan tentang hadis dan sunnah Rasulullah, tidak tahu atau tidak memahami manhaj as-salaf as-salih, tidak tahu atau tidak memahami makasih syariah, tidak memahami sunan ar-rabbaniyah, tidak memahami hakikat keimanan dan hubungannya dengan amal. Tujuh, jahil tentang maratib. Ya, jahil tentang maratib dan mertabat hukum hakam. Lapan, tidak tahu bahasa Arab. Sembilan, tak tahu sejarah. Faktor yang merujuk kepada penyimpangan manhaj ilmu. Ya, itu berikutnya. Faktor yang merujuk pada penyimpangan manaj ilmu seperti perbuatan mentakwil, 
menyasar dari makna yang sebenar serta tidak menghimpunkan dalil-dalil dalam satu keseluruhan kita mesti menyimpulkan dalil-dalil syarak dalam satu keseluruhan kalau nak buat satu hukuman terhadap satu suatu perbuatan tahun bersama orang jahat kita mesti ambil dalil am dan dalil yang khususkan makna am baru kita buat kesimpulan tapi kalau kita hanya ambil dalil am ta'awanu alal birri dan kita tak hubung kaitkan dengan wala tarkanu ilal ladzina zalamu ayat yang mengkhususkan ayat am itu maka keputusan kita keputusan boleh bersama berskongkol dengan orang jahat dan zalim dah tipu berbelion-belion okey sebab dia Melayu dan muslim ah ha. salah tu dari segi pendalilan salah tidak amanah dalam melaksanakan memahami nas tidak mencampurkannya tidak menghubungkan dalam satu keseluruhan maka kesimpulannya songsang tidak melihat atau merujuk seluruh dalil yang berkaitan memahami nas secara literal atau harfiah ya kemudian beristihad tanpa memilih syarat-syarat untuk beristihad tanpa memiliki syarat beristihad terlalu fokus kepada hadis yang memerihalkan tentang fitnah Terlalu bergantung kepada mimpi dan takbirnya. Kadang mimpi pun jadi hukum. Ha, ini masalah. Bila mimpi boleh jadi dalil syarah? Tentang okay. masyarakat. Uh, <coughs> Faktor yang berkaitan dengan manhaj amali yang silap. Seperti sifat istiqjal, gopoh, tidak mengambil kira keadaan khusus yang meliputi seseorang atau kumpulan. Kita ada kes seperti umumul balwa. Umumul balwa konsep kaedah syarak. Kalau dah sudah suatu itu memang orang dah terima. Pada dasarnya yang kena zakat adalah mas. Tetapi umumul balwa orang sudah gunakan duit kertas. Ada nilai. Kalau kita buat kesimpulan Duit kertas tak wajib zakat. Maka, tak ada boleh zakat, tak bayar sebab duit kertas. Ini tidak merujuk kepada kaedah umumul balwa. Kita nak buat dinar Islam, tapi belum buat lagi. Dan banyak dinar-dinar, mereka dah buat balik. Di Baghdad, di Libya, ber bilion emas dibawa balik oleh mereka dinar kita tak buat lagi macam mana kita buat satu fatwa tak boleh keluar zakat hari ini saya berhadapan dengan kes dekat Palembang ada seorang ceramah saya kata no dia kata ulama silap dia dah eh, macam mana boleh ulama silap ulama tak silap kalau dia guna fatwa itu ni, saya kata habis semua orang miskin menjadi miskin tak ada, tak ada duit. Rupiah semua dia nak semua kertas. Berkaitan dengan watak kejiwaan serta emosi ya. Uh, juga ber, berbanyak faktor, bagai-bagai faktor tuan-tuan uh, yang menyebabkan kita uh, melakukan al-ghulu ya. Uh, antaranya adalah ya ketiadaan keserasian dan kesepakatan kerana kita ni tak boleh kawan dengan orang selalu nak bergaduh ya kerana kehendak biologi kemanusi dan kemanusiaan yang tidak dipenuhi ada juga kerana dia mungkin tak kahwin-kahwin jadi dia sangat marah cepat je marah sebab dia tak kahwin kan <laughs> misalnya tapi kalau dia dah kahwin mungkin dia relax sikit kurang marah sikit kerana Masalah kejiwaan dan perangai yang buruk. Ada manusia yang memang dah perangai dia macam tu. Kelemahan watak pimpinan yang mengeluarkan arahan. Pemimpin tak bagi arahan. Pemimpin buat tak tahu je. Orang buat kapikan orang pun dia tak kisah. Dia pun macam tu juga tolong kapikan orang juga. Jadi ini pemimpin yang rosak. Ya, dia menyebabkan orang lain akan menjadi takfiri. Ya melampau dan sebagainya 
kurang sabar cepat berputus asa ya boleh kita sebutkan pertama kurang sabar mudah putus asa sifat melencong atau dikuasai oleh karinah orang muda suka menurut hawa nafsu cenderung berbantah dan bertegang orang leher dia ni memang suka apa saja mesti dia nak bantah dia nak tunjuk dia hebat ya? natijah atau hasil dari kelemahan sukatan pendidikan juga masalah kelemahan faktor pendidikan ya? jadi tuan-tuan dan sekalian faktor yang berkaitan dengan persekitaran yang bobrok kerana krisis ekonomi, sosiopolitik dan sebagainya ya? ini dapat kita ringkaskan ya? kerana undang-undang Allah tidak dilaksanakan dalam kebanyakan negara umat Islam Kedua, kesenjangan, kerosakan akidah. Ketiga, pengabaian kewajipan amal ma'ruf nahi mungkar. Keempat, krisis hubungan antara pemerintah dengan rakyat yang diperintah. Perangai suka mentohmah, menghina dan merendah-rendahkan antara satu sama lain. Ini juga faktor ya, uh, psikologi. Ya, sifat uh, keras, kasar, suka menyakiti orang lain. Tujuh, dekadensi akhlak atau keruntuhan moral. Lapan, pengaruh krisis ekonomi dan kemiskinan. Sembilan, kekurangan atau kehilangan kesan dan pengaruh peranan ulama muktabar. Ulama muktabar tak ada. Yang, yang ada semua ulama jadi-jadian. Ulama uh, majlis. Yeah. Kehilangan jati diri dan syaksiah umat. Berkembangnya pengaruh sekularisme. Ya, tuan -tuan. Berkembangnya pengaruh sekularisme dalam masyarakat umat Islam Kerosakan jantera pengarahan dan mereka yang berpengaruh Kelemahan syura dan sistem muafakat Perkeruncingan hubungan dan masalah kelompok mazhab dan sekte ya. Kegagalan politik dan kekalahan ketenteraan Jadi ini juga merupakan faktor-faktor yang Ya, menyebabkan berlaku ekstremism. Akhirnya faktor konspirasi luar negara, lantaran serangan-serangan kuasa jahat, kuasa besar terhadap dunia Islam yang meledakkan fenomena berkenaan. Secara lebih jelas ialah konspirasi global ya, menjatuhkan serta melemahkan kuasa umat Islam. Hari ini kita tengok perang, hampir lagi nak berlaku perang kepada Negara umat Islam, negara Iran Setelah diserang Baghdad, diserang Afghanistan Diserang banyak-banyak lagi negara Yaman dan sebagainya Nak diserang Iran pula Tapi mujurlah Tak jadi, Alhamdulillah Jadi surat sekalian Kejatuhan Khilafah Usmaniyah Ke umat dan negara Islam Kini di bawah era penjajahan baru Dan globalisasi Ini diparahkan lagi oleh hutang oleh pengaruh rasuah dan dedak-dedak di dalam dan di luar negara. Ha, ini cuma semua sudah sekian merupakan perkara. Ya. Pendek kata, banyak sebab yang memburukkan lagi keadaan. Sama ada kelemahan dalaman maupun persaingan politik yang diurus dengan buruk dan sembrono. Ya. Benci kerana dah kalah. Duk kapikan orang saja. Duk kata orang komunis pula. Hancing habis komunis orang. Kerajaan Malaysia komunis. Kata seorang pendakwah dari parti pemangkang. Politik ini uruskan dengan buruk dan sembrono. Ini di samping peranan media konvensional dan media sosial yang menukuk tambah serta menyebabkan kesan wulu dan ekstremisme menular semakin parah dan membarah dalam masyarakat. Jadi sudah soal sekalian, apakah kesan ya? Kesan hulu ya, Terdapat berbagai peringkat Dan lapangan di mana kesan Sikap hulu ini menjejaskan Berbagai aspek dan suasana kehidupan umat Antaranya ialah uh, Dalam bidang akidah uh, Jalur dan style pemikiran Kelakuan Dan kesan sosial ya. uh, <coughs> Kesan hulu ini ada banyak Perkara yang ya, menyebabkan kita menjadi huara Ya Uh, dari sudut akidah kita dapat sesat dari jalan hidayah. 
kesan daripada hulu ialah sesat dari jalan hidayah berpecah belah dan berantakan yang ketiga mendakwa yang tidak munasabah terhadap syariah dakwaan-dakwaan yang tak munasabah terhadap syariah dari sudut kesan pemikiran <coughs> berlaku pertentangan dan pertembungan tembung aja mencemarkan imej Islam dan umat Islam Islam tercemar dan imejnya tercalar menjauhkan orang ramai dari mendekati Islam ingat orang anggap Islam ni agama ganas ya? dia semua sendiri bunuh semua sendiri ya kita tengok seorang wartawan Hasubji digergaji di Istanbul ya kita lihat Menggencat dan menghapuskan gambaran positif Islam sebagai agama perdana dan wasatiyah. Ya. Dari sudut kelakuan, terjebak ke kancah maksiat dan kejahatan. Ada yang pergi nak berperang di Syria, nak masuk syurga atau nak mati syahid atau nak kahwin dengan orang Daesh. Sedangkan mereka melakukan eh, perkara-perkara yang mengkar. Terhalang untuk beramal dan bekerja. Gejala semakin kusut pemikiran dan jiwa serta perasaan. Semakin jauh dari bimbingan Allah. Makin sesat. Jadi saudara sekalian, dari sudut uh, kesan dan pengaruh sosial. Himpitan Allah terhadap manusia yang bengkeng dan bersikap hulu ni semakin terus, makin ya, terasa. Berkembangnya gejala mensia-siakan hak orang lain. Kecenderungan membunuh orang Islam dan meninggalkan penyembah berhala, kecelakaan dan musibah bertambah-tambah. Jadi tuan-tuan dan sekalian, ya, uh, Kesannya begitu uh, banyak. Bagaimana mengatasi sifat ulu dan ekstremism? Uh, ini barangkali lebih penting kerana faktor penyebab gejala ini rencam dan pelbagai. Maka usaha pemulihannya memerlukan pelbagai tindakan pendidikan, disiplin, perundangan dan rawatan. InsyaAllah kita akan ungkapkan ya, yang pertama, satu persatu. Yang pertama, asas dan dasar usaha pemulihan. Ya. Uh, untuk menggerakkan usaha mengatasi gejala ini uh, di atas landasan yang kokoh untuk kerja pemulihan perlu kita mempunyai dasar tertentu antaranya dasar tersebut pada hikmat kami ialah ya penentuan gejala hulu mesti merujuk ya kepada kriteria syariat ia bukan merujuk kepada kehendak nafsu gelojoh or politician tertentu atau selebriti tentu tidak. Yang kedua, pegawai dan orang bertanggungjawab mengatasi perlu mempunyai kelayakan merawat mengatasi gejala ini. Bukan sebarang orang. Ketiga, usaha merawat dan mengatasinya mestilah seimbang dan bercorak wasati. Sederhana. Empat, sedar tentang berapa kriteria dan perbezaan antara kita kena beza hulu yang membawa kepada kekufuran al yuadi hulu yuadi ila al-kufur dan hulu yang tidak membawa kepada kekufuran wal farq bainal hulu alladhi la yuadi ila al-kufur hulu juz'i yang berbanding hulu kuli hulu yang merujuk kepada ilmu dan yang merujuk kepada jahil hulu akibat ijtihad dan Akibat taklid, ya. hulu mentakwil dan hulu tanpa takwil, hulu orang hulu yang mengajak orang lain atau hulu yang pasif. Ada hulu ajak orang lain, tapi ada hulu pasif dia sesuatu. Eh. G kumpulan hulu yang memerangi atau bersenjata dan yang tidak bersenjata. Ya. Jadi tuan-tuan. Uh, banyak ya uh, Jadi berbekalkan dengan kriteria di atas Pihak yang bertanggungjawab Memimpin 
pemimpin, ulama, ilmuwan, jabatan-jabatan yang bertanggungjawab dan masyarakat boleh merangka beberapa bentuk dan rancangan rawatan dalam berbagai aspek. Jadi rawatan yang berasaskan kepada akidah, tuan-tuan, apa dia? Akidah adalah teras kehidupan tanpa teras manusia mudah hanyut terkapai-kapai dalam ketelanjuran, kesesatan dan dekadensi moral. Sebab itu individu dan kumpulan umat perlu berpegang teguh ya, dengan Al-Quran dan Hadis. Itu yang pertama. Yang kedua, berpegang kemas menurut landasan mazhab Ahli Sunnah wal Jamaah dalam konteks kita kumpulan Ahli Sunnah wal Jamaah. Maksudnya kena ikut itu. Yang ketiga, menyebar mazhab salaf. Yang keempat, mengetahui dan menguasai hakikat iman dan hubungannya dengan amal yang kelima ya uh, <coughs> meyakini dalil mutasyabih dan beramal dengan dalil yang muhkam beramal dengan dalil yang muhkam mutasyabih kita boleh yakin yang keenam mentertibkan hubungan antar pemerintah dengan yang diperintah atau rakyat tertibul alaqah bainal hakim wal mahkum Eh, memberikan rawatan khas bersifat akidah yakni mu'alajah khassah antar antari kal akidah melindungi agama dan nista dari nista para pencerca agama al hifaz din min man eh, yal'an al din ya eh. pemulihan dan rawatan berasaskan ilmu pengetahuan ya tahap pendidikan dan pendidikan itu sendiri harus mempengaruhi faktor sikap dan perilaku seseorang. Sebab itu peningkatan ilmu pengetahuan juga merupakan gerbang penyelesaian masalah hulu. Umat perlu ditingkatkan dari sudut ya, pertama kepercayaan keperluan mempelajari ilmu syariat, yang kedua menguasai manhaj pendalilan istidlal dan istimbat perumusan dalil yang betul. Anda jangan barangan ambil ayat ya am mesti dikaitkan dengan khas kerana ma min amin illa wa qad khussa tidak ada yang am melainkan telah dikhususkan kalau anda tak hubung tak gabungkan dua-dua dalil itu anda buat kesimpulan anda sesat anda tak akan masuk syurga anda masuk neraka walaupun jubah anda besar ya itu itu masalahnya menyebarkan mazhab saleh mengetahui dan menguasai hakikat iman dengan apa meyakini dalil uh, mutasyabih dan beramal dengan dalil yang muhkam seperti yang saya sebutkan tadi. Uh, yang pemulihan dan rawatan berasaskan ilmu ya tuan-tuan dan sekalian keperluan mempelajari syariat yang ketiga memperkemas kefahaman tentang lafaz dan ungkapan syariat mana kita kena tahu yang kelima sederhana dalam menilai ketelanjuran ulama ya uh, sederhana dalam menilai Ketelanjuran ulama, ulama yang kena ulama perlu meramai menunaikan kewajipan masing-masing. Ya. Yang ketujuh mewajibkan hujah menjawab hujah manusia gulu. Yang kelapan memencil dan mengasingkan mereka. Yang kesembilan menjatuhkan hukuman yang setimpal. Yang kesepuluh mengatasi faktor kesenjangan ekonomi kerana kemiskinan kefakiran hampir menyebabkan orang menjadi kufur ya kadal fakhu an yakuna kufra jadi kemiskinan juga boleh menyebabkan orang menjadi banyak bermasalah sama ada beragama ataupun berbudaya berpolitik dan sebagainya akhirnya tuan sekalian penutup saya ingin katakan perbincangan tentang hulu dan ekstremisme memang memerlukan ruang masa dan tenaga yang banyak ya uh, <tuh> Kita memang memerlukan tulisan dan kajian yang lebih lanjut dan terperinci. Tulisan ini hanya sebagai permulaan bagi suatu atau malah berpuluh kajian-kajian baru yang akan diperincikan, yang akan memperincikan lagi fakta dan data baru tentang permasalahan ini dan isu ini. Penulis mempunyai kudrat dan masa yang terhad. Ini pun mungkin dah terlajak masa sikit. Saya minta maaf. Tapi tuan-tuan boleh rujuk lagi ya daripada tulisan-tulisan yang lain yang uh, akan disampaikan oleh sahabat kita dan saya maaf minta maaf kerana panjang sikit yang dalam bahasa Melayu tapi boleh kita terjemahkan nanti dalam bahasa Inggeris dan Arab 
khasnya kita ada Google Translation. Tapi Google Translation pun perlu ada manusia. Kalau tidak, Google pun jadi melilau tak tentu arah. Jadi tuan-tuan sekalian saya minta maaf dan terima kasih kepada pihak penganjur kerana mengambil masa lebih. Tapi saya fikir ini kerana soalnya sangat penting dan kita dah kupas. Ya, wabillahi taufik. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. He has so many points, and I was so worried if I want to stop him, it will disturb him. Because for, for each point, if we were to elaborate, it will take the whole days of 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 not only days but weeks huh, to understand. And of course, there are some terminologies who are not of the those who are not from the background of, of Arabic might, might face difficulties of these things. But anyway, I think he has started with his presentation of how this extremis, extremism has been mentioned in the Quran. And I think from the hadith that he mentioned that, that the Prophet do, does not condone of this practice. And of course, he has um, been pointed out some of the uh, I mean, factors that contributed to this extremism from the scholar's point of view, uh, Yusuf al qardawi he mentioned a few. And then at, towards the end of his presentation, he has given the solutions, taking to how this faith, the Akedah, can, take, uh, to, can solve this practice, as well as the social, as, and, and, and last but not least, of course, from the knowledge as, as well as the uh, of, of education itself. And of course, the economic factors would be one of the important things towards the end of your presentation. But I would like to call upon uh, Associate Professor Dr. Daniel, Daniel Muhammad Yusuf, who will be sharing with us on track of violent extremism in the digital age. And for those who don't know him, Dr. Daniel, he is now based in Istanbul and he has been given a big task on this topic of this subject matter. Quite a number of research, quite a number of uh, presentations on this matter and I, I think perhaps he can share with us and when we talk about this uh, threat of violent extremism in the digital age I think this is the most important uh, factor or points that we would like to hear from you. Dr. Daniel? Uh, firstly, I'd like to um, thank uh, IAIS for this invitation and of course before I start uh, let me say Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh uh, The task given to me today is to speak on the threat of uh, terrorism um, in the digital age, especially with regards to what is normally now referred to as the post-caliphate uh, age. Uh, this uh, post-caliphate age, this so-called uh, post-caliphate age, of course, refers to the loss of territory of uh, ISIS or uh, Daesh. Yeah? So if they've lost, what's the concern now? Um, there's a lot to be worried about. Yeah? Uh, because as uh, numerous scholars have said, um, the ideology is very much still alive and the manifestation of that ideology uh, will of course also evolve from time to time. Uh, so the state uh, in that sense has to be um, eternally vigilant. Uh, the topic of my presentation is um, on the threat of hateful extremism violent extremism and terrorism in the digital age. Why are there these different concepts? Uh, because we often see uh, extremism as not necessarily the issue. Yeah? Um, there are steps uh, that lead extremism uh, into the path of violence. Uh, so uh, that's why there is sometimes a need to distinguish uh, between uh, these concepts. Um, if you look at these three concepts, terrorism, violent extremism, and hateful extremism, probably the latest addition is that of hateful extremism. Yeah? The belief that uh, ideologues of hate <clears throat> eventually lead uh, individuals or groups to justify the use of violence. Um, and from that justification of the use of violence, we move towards the act of violence. So these are the three steps. Uh, that eventually involve uh, the concern of uh, the security apparatus of the state uh, as well as society. So this is a quote from a rather controversial scholar, Jordan Peterson, yeah, he's a psychologist. Yeah, online violent ideologies can rapidly proliferate and spread and threats can leap borders and oceans in an instant. No nation can exist in a bubble of isolation. No country can imagine themselves immune from world events. 
And the security of each state increasingly depends on the security of all states. You can think of the entire internet as a place where ideas embodied in cyberspace are having a war. And it's not much different than the war of gods in heaven. I think he's referring to the pantheon of Greek gods in this case, eh? which has been taking place since there's been human beings. So the internet as the great enabler of extremism. Uh, these are the content of <coughs> my presentation. So first I will look at the um, terrorist use of online space and the challenges of digital communication. Uh, secondly, we'll look at uh, the model of risk or radicalization and recruitment, as well as how uh, prominent it is uh, with regards to the terrorist use of internet. Uh, we'll also discuss in number three, uh, ISIS post-caliphate. It's just without a home address and it's still there. Uh, and number four, we'll look at uh, a discussion, if time permits, uh, of research publications uh, on terrorism, use of online space. we we'll look at the examples of tech against terror, which in a way became quite prominent after the Christchurch call uh, last May, last year. Um, tech against terror on not just, of course, Islamic extremism, but also far-right extremism, um, and also a research uh, conducted on Islamic state ecosystem on Telegram, which, by the way, is still the preferred platform for uh, terrorist groups. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of conclusion where I'll try to discuss a bit about uh, activities that uh, the PCVE community uh, is undertaking uh, this year. So if you look at uh, terrorist use of internet and the challenges of uh, digital communication, it's often referred to uh, with regards to the platform of uh, Web 2.0. Yeah? So this is when we begin to uh, utilize um, social media as a platform for communication. Uh, so we have Web 2.0 and social media component, as well as uh, this idea of transnational uh, communities and organization, a kind of techno-utopia. Yeah? There was a, a belief in a borderless world. Anybody of you who was uh, um, at least a youth in the 90s will, will probably uh, realize there was this sense of idealism. It may have been a bit uh, misdirected, but definitely there was an idealism with regards to the global community during this time. But as we uh, grew along, uh, this path of um, digitalization, yeah, uh, we also began to realize uh, the, the downsides uh, that come together with it. Yeah? The existence of cybercrime, uh, violent extremism, as well as terrorism, as well as despotic regimes. Yeah? Um, conducting surveillance with regards to the activities of their citizens um, on online space. Um, also, we see how Web 2.0 has went on to enable or facilitate uh, radicalization, um, recruitment, as well as organization, yeah? uh, planning, as well as uh, planning towards the execution of terror acts. Um, if you remember, uh, the social media itself uh, was in a way uh, highlighted as uh, one of the main platforms that enabled uh, what was formerly known as the Arab Spring. Now, we historically refer to it as the Arab Winter. Yeah? So digital communications usage informing national and transnational communication, linkages between groups, um, organizing offline action. Yeah? The planning is all done on Telegram, for example, when we talk about extremists and terror groups. Um, and how uh, social media or Web 2.0 is uh, used to facilitate uh, violent radicalization as well. Yeah? If you look at all of the cases in Malaysia with regards to uh, uh, VE and terrorism, uh, you will find that there is the element of social media involved uh, in their radicalization process. So if you look at the use of the internet itself, uh, it wasn't pioneered by Muslims. Yeah? Uh, if you look at Web 1.0, uh, the idea actually uh, came uh, to be utilized by far-right extremist groups. Yeah? The radical right was the pioneer uh, users of online space. Uh, if you Google on Stormfront, yeah, as well as uh, the English Defense League and Britain First, uh, these are examples of uh, when extremist groups, yeah, far-right extremists in this case, 
uh, began to utilize uh, the internet as a platform for recruitment as well as for disseminating of their ideas. Um, you can still, I think, go to stormfront.org. It's still functional, but the numbers of those who have gone to the site uh, is reduced. Um, if you read the official literature, it says that it shut down in 2017, but you can still access it. Yeah? Uh, but now we live in the web 2.0. Public elements of global digital communication network characterized by public access and use of this design, architecture, increasing nature of digital space uh, as walled gardens, yeah? uh, security space uh, within or on uh, the internet. And this has led to many issues which we will discuss, uh, I think, a bit later. Uh, issues with regards to Telegram, for example, about uh, the private channels and about uh, the balance that we have to find between security as well as privacy of individual users. Yeah? Uh, in many ways, I understand the Durov brothers uh, with regards to why uh, they are resisting um, the call of security agencies with regards to access to data and so on. When you look at terrorist use of the internet and challenges of digital communication, you can, for example, identify uh, four challenges. Yeah? You find, number one, proliferation of radical or weaponized narratives, hateful extremism, and content. They are easily within reach. If you try to search for them, you will find them. Yeah? Number two, development of closed and self-reinforcing echo chambers. Yeah? In a way, it gives you a false impression that you are in a democratic environment, but the fact of the matter is that you tend to speak within uh, a certain uh, mindset of groupthink. Yeah? So you only speak to those who share the same ideology, the same beliefs with you, um, and you uh, develop a resistance to those who have a different narrative than you. There's also the possibility of rapidly accelerated radi radicalization because of the ease of access to these uh, materials as well as uh, the possibility of autodidactic uh, self-radicalization. Yeah? Uh, the case of Anders Breivik, for example, is a case of self-radicalization. Um, of course, it can work both ways. We also have heard of the case of this Scottish man who converted to Islam without meeting other Muslims. It can work both ways. In the case of extremism, uh, in the case of Anders Breivik, uh, most famously, most famously um, it was uh, probably the most famous case of um, self-radicalization, uh, at least up until uh, the uh, Christchurch incident. So uh, policymakers have had to respond to this risk. Yeah? So what policymakers have to respond to the risk of digital communication? Uh, number one, uh, the example I gave just now uh, of Anders Breivik, um, also because of the anonymity of the internet. Yeah? It's easy to, to lose yourself uh, in cyberspace with regards to uh, materials and whatnot. There's also cumulative extremism uh, and the 24-hour communication cycle uh, where you will find competing extremism and uh, a down, downward spiral, you can say, yeah? and also of revenge acts. What followed uh, Christchurch? Sri Lanka. Yeah? And Sri Lanka was a revenge act against what uh, occurred in uh, New Zealand. Yeah? So globalized in a negative way, you can say. Uh, why? Because of cumulative extremism. Uh, also, the internet uh, mainstream said uh, there's media framing, perceptions of causation, responsibility and response, uh, democracy of social media and negative messaging. If you follow uh, news items, even in Malaysia, if you look at the response threat, you will be appalled. Uh, the negativity, uh, the racism, the discrimination inherent in the comments uh, is a reality of, I think, everyday life now. And what um, this has meant is uh, the regulation and role of technology multinationals. Uh, we'll get to some of these efforts that are being undertaken, uh, I think, towards the end of my talk. Let's look at the Malaysian scenario. Um, in August, um, we conducted an international PCVE, Prevention and Countering Violent Extremism Seminar, 
Our friends who were involved in this seminar are also here. I see Haji Jamal and um, Siasat uh, and others yeah, who were involved in this seminar, where the Ministry of Home Affairs gave a, a keynote. Uh, so these numbers have changed now, but this was the, these were the numbers that were quoted um, in uh, August uh, 2019. 519 arrests related to terrorism under Porta and Sosma. Uh, 266 social media accounts taken down uh, in that time period. And Malaysia, of course, has yet to develop a national action plan on CBE. This is something that I'm uh, still lobbying uh, to achieve, uh, perhaps by the end of the year. Of the total arrests under SOSMA, 82% are below the age of 40, if you look at the definition of youth uh, prior to the um, uh, change in that definition. Now it's until 30. Even if it's until 18 until 30, the number is still about 50 plus percent. Uh, and 175 uh, convictions from those arrests. And there you can find the numbers with regards to uh, different age groups. Also on top of that, you find the uh, returnees from Syria as well. The numbers keep changing. If you listen to E8 uh, briefings, um, in August it was 50. Uh, but back in November or December, I believe there was a, a talk at UM. Um, they were uh, identifying the possibility of there being 120, 240 returnees. A number of them are already starting to, to come back uh, to Malaysia. Yeah. So if you look at all of these cases, you have the prominence of the internet as the enabler of radicalization um, or recruitment uh, into organizations. Eh? So these are uh, figures taken from the 298 source mark cases reported in the Malaysian Law Journal and uh, newspapers. Uh, so we have many examples of uh, ISIS or the issues of social media, media to expose vulnerable people to radicalization or recruitment. Uh, one famous blog is, of course, the Bird of Jannah. Uh, we also have cases where a 14-year-old secondary school student was radicalized via Facebook. Two university students planning to leave for Syria. The female married to a foreign fighter via Skype. A man who found sympathy for the cause through YouTube videos. And of course, the prominent use of Telegram, as well as lesser known uh, social media platforms such as Trima. Yeah. Why is it still a concern? Because radicalization is still happening in the post-caliphate period. Yeah? There have been recent cases of radicalization on campus. Yeah? I can't mention where, but we have uh, decided to finally agree to treat these cases as off-ramp or uh, through mentoring techniques. So we don't make it into uh, an enforcement or legal uh, case yet. So we try to radicalize, de-radicalize the individuals uh, through non-enforcement uh, mechanisms. Um, we were also, for example, having a discussion with Indonesian counterparts. Uh, this was organized by the uh, JPM or the Prime Minister's Office. And during that discussion, our Indonesian counterparts received news of uh, the Medan uh, attack, yeah? which occurred on November 13th. Um, and uh, following investigations, it was found out that there was also an alternate plan uh, with regards to uh, a bombing in Bali, which of course never came uh, to light. Yeah, it never occurred. So this was uh, a plan uh, and an act that was uh, carried out by uh, Jamaah Ansarud Daulah, uh, which involved a husband and wife and two bomb makers. I think a few days after this uh, initial attack, uh, Densus 88, the counter-terrorism agency of Indonesia, uh, did a number of uh, operations uh, to neutralize the bomb makers. And all of this was conducted through infiltration of Telegram. If you look at the radicalization model developed by Malaysian scholars, this is something that was done by Ahmad al Muhammadi, uh, his PhD thesis that was supervised by uh, Professor Fauzi, uh, that was examined by Professor Fauzi, but supervised by myself uh, last year. Yeah? Uh, from uh, the process of exposure to internalization, externalization, and um, actualization. Yeah? All of these phases involve uh, the internet. Yeah? 
so the enabler of uh, radicalization of extremism um, that is of social media is something that we constantly have to look at uh, in terms of security as well as resilience uh, approach. Uh, there was a recent um, study done by uh, Malik, eh, 2020. This article was passed to me a few days ago by um, Tajuddin of Siasat. Uh, youth vulnerability to radicalization. Um, the study was uh, looking at far-right extremism as well as Islamists. Um, it was looking at push and pull factors, yeah, structural as well as individual factors. Uh, that lead individuals uh, into the path of radicalization, uh, as well as enablers. Uh, focus was on group mentality. If you look at individuals, especially that of youth, um, the reason for them uh, joining um, radical groups, this is in the UK, eh? uh, is mainly to escape from violent home conditions uh, or because they lack opportunities uh, to sustain themselves at home. Uh, pull factors include marriage, uh, fame, as well as uh, eventually once they are recruited, uh, they themselves become recru recruiters themselves uh, with regards to their own age groups as well as uh, friends in their own community. Um, according to the researcher Nikita Malik, eh, uh, age is critical to radicalization. Uh, the youth will always seek extreme ideas to make sense of the world, uh, terrorist offenders, uh, like violent criminals themselves may grow out of it. Yeah? So given a uh, certain period of time as well as experience, a uh, radical individual uh, will probably mellow down. Yeah? Um, this can be contentious, of course. If you speak of the case of Yazid Sufahad, um, can you say that he is de-radicalized? Most will say no. Yeah? But we can all agree that he is disengaged. Yeah? Now, because of recruitment and retention motivating factors, uh, the suggestion of this particular scholar is that we may look at gang policy, yeah? the way that gangsterism and whatnot um, happen in a community. Uh, this may inform approaches to youth associated with radicalization in prevention, intervention, as well as um, rehabilitation. Yeah? Uh, former extremists can also help with extreme uh, religious or political ideology. This is something that we are already uh, using now in our different uh, campaigns, uh, activities involving the youth. Yeah? Uh, we'll get a bit into this, uh, I think, at the end of the talk as well, what we are doing um, as... Uh, last week, we actually had... Um, program with Malaysian youth, eh? uh, a pilot program uh, with uh, trainers, uh, potential trainers for uh, a national youth program that will be held at the end of this month. Now, if you look at ISIS, yeah? ISIS is, uh, as a post-caliphate, is just without a home address. Uh, why even they themselves, in a way, um, uh, envision uh, this possibility? Yeah? Uh, towards the end of the physical existence of uh, ISIS, uh, there was an emphasis on online um, appeals as well as approaches. Yeah? Widen reach, connect with far-flung militant groups, and exhaust enemies with a war of attrition. Yeah? So the brand of global jihad until the day of judgment. So despite the loss of territory, uh, the internet or cyberspace is uh, the new platform with which to continue with the dissemination of the ideology. Uh, so, for example, uh, ISIS congratulated allegiance from groups in Libya, Mali, Burkina Faso, Pakistan, and claiming all accused of attacks from airline groups in Sri Lanka, Congo, Saudi Arabia, Philippines, and Libya. These were occurrences uh, last year towards the end of the physical uh, state of uh, IS. Uh, the plan of attack is developed and conceived abroad or online, but local radicals are recruited for implementation. So this is the modus operandi uh, that you can identify with IS um, currently. Yeah? So the manifestation of the ideology um, as far as um, attacks, um, as well as the realization of a future caliphate uh, may occur uh, in regional contexts um, in the case of Southeast Asia. Um, there is the sustainability of an expensive online presence, which they still are. Yeah? Um, the territorial loss 
uh, is seen by their supporters as a fulfillment of prophecies uh, and a test of belief. So it doesn't, in a way, uh, promote them into a kind of realization that what they have been doing was wrong. Yeah? So they see it as a, as a test of their conviction uh, towards the ideology. And you will also see the ISIS as uh, an interna international or transnational organization, uh, now with a dissented sense of uh, provinces. Uh, and when you look at certain occurrences last year, uh, you find that the level of extremist violence also has, uh, in a way, uh, evolved as well. We have the cult of martyrdom yeah, involving individuals and their family members yeah, uh, in Indonesian terror attacks. We'll have a look at um, a few recent publications on terrorism use of online space. Yeah? Uh, there's two examples that I want to mention here. Uh, attack against terrorism, an online response to the Halle terrorist attack in Germany uh, last year. Attack against terrorism uh, was an initiative that was uh, uh, basically realized by the United Nations uh, Counter-Terrorism uh, Executive Directorate. Uh, and they had, in a way, their first acid test yeah? uh, after the crisis call uh, summit that was done in France uh, in May of last year. Uh, there was then a terror attack uh, which involved a synagogue. Yeah? So it was anti-Semitism uh, conducted by a far-right extremist group. Uh, today, when you look at uh, the role of social media as well as um, platforms uh, of the internet, uh, there is the concern for uh, balancing security and surveillance. Yeah? Uh, so you need, at the same time, to look into security concerns, uh, but at the same time, you also need to look into the protection of freedom of expression, of uh, privacy, of non-discrimination and diversity, um, uh, transparency as well as accountability, uh, as well as remedy and collaboration between governments and uh, tech companies. Yeah? So this is why uh, Tech Against Terror was uh, created as a platform yeah, to encourage collaboration between uh, nation states as well as tech companies, uh, especially companies that are not so big, yeah? smaller tech companies. Um, this was um, tested through the Hala terrorist attack. So part of the reason that um, Tech Against Terror was created uh, through um, there are different mechanisms. Uh, it did prove to be effective yeah, in limiting proliferation of the video itself uh, through GIFCT as well as their content incident protocol, uh, TCAP and uh, the alert function, yeah, uh, content analytics uh, protocol. Yeah. Uh, so what you have here is uh, tech against terror, uh, identifying uh, hashtags uh, and whatnot that terrorists tend to use. Uh, this is learned from the Christchurch incident to limit the dissemination of videos of manifestos online. Uh, and it was helpful to a certain extent. So it was helpful, but it was also undermined uh, by minority of fringe platforms uh, that, were not, uh, that did not buy into the idea of tech against terror, as well as a mainstream uh, tabloid uh, responsible for media sensationalism. So they did. Uh, I think reproduce images from the video as well as the manifestos with regards to the Holler terrorist attack. So if you look at um, the way that this uh, attack against terror platform was successful to a certain extent, it managed to limit the dissemination. Yeah? So it was only, for example, a live stream on Twitch, which is um, a minor platform for 35 minutes, watched by five people, and after 30 minutes, uh, it was uh, expanded to uh, 2,200 people um, who had watched, had downloaded, and shared uh, the video. Yeah? Uh, eventually, it was watched on Telegram uh, by uh, about 16,000 accounts. Yeah? And this is excluding private channels. So if you look at uh, the number of uh, cases they sample, 70% uh, are private channels, 30% are public. So there still is a need for them to do outreach. Yeah? Terrorist organizations, uh, violent extremist uh, groups, they need to do outreach in order to get numbers uh, into their ranks. Yeah? As I mentioned earlier, public channels play an important role as keynotes for entry into the private network. So if you look at the agreement between Telegram and uh, international security apparatus, they agree 
uh, with the sharing of uh, information from public channels, but not private networks. Yeah. It still has, is an issue uh, because they value the security of their uh, customers. Um, there's a further example given here uh, of how one individual recruiter can play a prominent role in the dissemination of the ideology um, of extremism. So we have the case of Karen uh, Aiza Hamidun eh, of Marawi City. Uh, she uh, managed to create a network spanning across 25 countries. Um, and she also played a very successful role as a network facilitator. Uh, I think the height of her activities was during the Marawi siege. Uh, by way of conclusion, uh, these are some of the things that we are doing um, in Malaysia at the moment. As far as CVE is concerned, we are developing uh, capacity. Yeah, we're developing tools and simulations to help with target segmentation of uh, youth at risk uh, online. Uh, ISTAC, for example, is working with the University of Maryland, with START, National Consortium for the Study of uh, Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, uh, in relation to developing a simulation to look at uh, how youth respond to uh, recruitment online. Uh, this is something that we will try to test with the Ministry of Youth and Sports uh, in a number of our uh, zonal activities for uh, empowering the youth against extremism. Um, so we'll be doing it and developing it with another grant, hopefully by the end of the year. And we'll try to get some uh, results from this uh, pilot study. Um, at the same time, there still is a lot of weakness with regards to um, strategic communication. Yeah? Uh, when I spoke of the two cases of radicalized individuals on campus, how did we find out about these cases? We did not find out about these cases through uh, grassroots CVE workers or through the authorities of the university and so on. How did we find out about these two individual cases? We found it out through information from international security agencies. So there is still a lot to be done uh, with regards to developing capacity um, at the grassroots level. Yeah? So I think, to a certain extent, Malaysian universities uh, require a CVE action plan as well. Uh, we need to, uh, I think, give awareness as well as develop capacity uh, amongst our counsellors, amongst our uh, deans, uh, lecturers, and so on, uh, with regards to uh, taking note of the possible red flags of uh, radicalized individuals and groups uh, on campus. Um, also, at the same time, we are engaged with the Ministry of Youth and Sports for a national um, CVE, uh, we call it a Youth Pack Convention. Yeah, this is to empower the youth. Uh, we are working with KBS as well as uh, Youth Power Club, which was recently created. Um, actually, as I'm speaking now, my colleagues are having, I think, a discussion with uh, KBS for our uh, national level uh, conference or convention. Uh, at IUM Gomba at the end of this month, from the 29th to 31st um, of this month. So we're working with a lot of people, and one thing that uh, is very good about the CVE community in Malaysia is that uh, we tend to share yeah, expertise, uh, and we tend to collaborate with each other. Uh, so this was the zonal program that we did uh, at ISTAC last week. Yeah. So ISTAC, uh, KBS, so Ministry of Youth and Sports, as well as... Um, Youth Power Club. We'll have the national level uh, at the end of the month. And this is the International CVE Symposium in uh, March uh, that will bring together um, researchers, practitioners, uh, as well as uh, government agencies and whatnot. Uh, so we are looking forward to, to, I think, obtaining more collaborative efforts uh, with others uh, in Malaysia as well as regionally as well. Um, I think I should end here. We try to give some space for discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Daniel, uh, for your very interesting presentation. And I think uh, this digital era has managed to transform into uh, our planet, our countries, more into what we call a place of uncertainty in terms of security. And I think. Uh, the, the point that he shared with us, uh, where the authorities, uh, uh, there were about five, 519 arrests, uh, I mean, related to 
terrorism under the Porta and SOSMA, and 366 social media accounts taken down. And also, with some of the uh, I mean, slides that he shared with us, how these uh, telegrams and other channels in the media, social media, has managed to, uh, to, to advertise this bad practice among not only outside, but the most dangerous part will be among the people of Malaysia. And I think that will be something. I think his team is doing uh, the best for, for the country. Uh, we have less than 30 minutes for Q&A. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi uh, Nama saya Ainul Yakin, saya dari Ahmadiyah. Saya bercakap... Tak tak berapa terang, cakap kuat sikit. Nama saya Ainul Yakin bin Muhammad Zain. Saya dari Jemaat Ahmadiyah. Okay, uh, soalan saya ataupun mungkin uh, saya nak share sikit. Berkenaan dengan penceramah yang kedua tadi Tentang faktor pendidikan Memang kita lihat Memang faktor pendidikan ini memainkan peranan yang penting Di mana kita pendidiklah Mendidik generasi yang akan datang Tentang apa itu Islam Bagaimana tindakan kita uh, Menghadapi keganasan dan ekstremisme uh, Soalan saya Setengah sekolah Yang saya pergi sendiri Saya nampak bahawa pendidik itu guru-guru di hari pertama lagi mereka dah memasukkan sifat kebencian kepada anak-anak murid mereka terhadap kaum dan agama lain. Pengalaman saya sendiri apabila saya mengantar anak saya ke sekolah derajat satu hari pertama guru datang masuk ke kelas dan dia mengucapkan assalamualaikum warahmatullah dan dia ikuti juga dia kata cuma murid-murid Islam saja yang boleh jawab Yang bukan Islam tak boleh jawab Jadi di sini dari kecil, dari didik Bahawa kamu memang asing dari yang lain Kamu tak boleh bergaul dengan mereka Ini faktor pendidikan Dan yang kedua Juga faktor pendidikan di mana kita melihat Banyak uh, ustaz-ustaz dan para ulama-ulama Yang uh, memberikan Uh, penafsiran yang negatif tentang kedatangan uh, juruselamat ataupun Imam Mahdi yang akan datang bahawa dia akan datang dengan pedang. Dia akan menghancurkan orang-orang Islam dan membunuh orang Islam. Sedangkan kedatangan seseorang yang uh, berbentuk Imam Mahdi itu pastinya membawa kepada keamanan seperti mana Rasulullah SAW. Huh? Itu yang saya lihat. Ini yang faktor pendidikan dua. Dan yang ketiga, yang terakhir, apa peranan para ulama yang uh, terhadap para pemimpin yang tadi disentuh juga mengkafirkan orang. Dan fatwa itu ada. Fatwa itu mengatakan grup A atau kelompok A ini kafir. Dan itu menjadi satu fatwa. Nah, apa peranan para ulama dan majlis syurah sendiri Berkenaan dengan perkara ini Kalau kita tidak betulkan perkara ini Maka kafir mengkafirkan akan terus berlaku Itu saja Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh okay, Terima kasih, thank you The lady at the bank Just now, where is the lady? Okay, come, please Assalamualaikum So, uh, I'm Shafiq from Kashmir actually uh, okay, Can I, you speak louder? We can't hear from up here uh, okay, Your name uh, please repeat Yeah, uh, my name is Shafiq I'm from Kashmir so my question is that how can we differentiate between an extremist group or the groups that are helping people like Kashmir who are in, living in a conflict zone, who have been uh, suffering from so long? And how will we, you know, the, the, the portrayal of Western media the, 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 as, you know, I am living in a Kashmir, uh, I have been, we have been suffering from so long. There are people who are helping us out and you can see through the Indian media, they are labeling us as terrorists. So how can we tackle this problem? How can we help these people who are, who are living like this? So this is my question. Thank you. Uh, okay, then. Can, we, can I pass the mic to Dato Wira first and followed by the other speakers to respond to the question? Anda semua tahu bahawa pendidikan di Malaysia ini banyak dipengaruhi oleh faktor politik yang dominan sebelum ini, iaitu... Uh, 
uh, trend kemelayuan yang sekuler uh, di bawah barisan nasional yang jelas dan saya sehingga sampai sekarang pun tak boleh nak ceramah di masjid-masjid di Melaka sampai sekarang uh, walaupun kita dah menang masih uh, ini kesan dia jadi pendidikan guru-guru pun adalah diambil daripada kumpulan-kumpulan mereka yang terlalu totok dengan fahaman politik mereka, kepartaian mereka dan mereka menimbulkan kebencian sekarang ini bukan hanya kepada orang Islam bahkan sesama orang Islam yang bukan parti mereka yang dikira penipu dan hancing, komunis pun disebut jadi kesan politician atau parti yang terlalu fanatik kemelayuan dan liberalism dan yang membazir ini ya telah menyebabkan pengaruh itu meresap dan bertambah-tambah buruk dengan berlakunya ya perubahan politik yang terkini dan dan silapnya kumpulan Islam dalam membuat satu pilihan politik yang betul menyebabkan keadaan semakin parah. Oleh itu saya sangat sempati dengan apa yang beliau sebut tu dan ini memang menjanjikan sesuatu yang buruk untuk Malaysia. Sebab itu kita dapati pilihan raya di Tanjung Piai sangat membayangkan bagaimana mungkin Ya, pemikiran yang menganggap penjahat yang 60 tahun itu adalah yang akan menggantikan mengambil alih semula masa depan negara Malaysia yang terbaik dan menang begitu punya tinggi menunjukkan masalah kekeliruan semakin parah jadi saya simpati dengan apa yang beliau sebut dan adanya ustaz-ustaz yang melihat dengan penuh kebencian pada orang lain ini juga membayangkan kegagalan ya, parti sebelum ini atau kerajaan sebelum ini membentuk guru-guru yang lebih rasional dan lebih bijak dalam konteks memahami perkembangan semasa. Tapi yang ada adalah guru yang dipengaruhi oleh tren politik keagamaan ataupun kebangsaan yang sangat anti kepada uh, Kawan dia pun, dia sangat benci dan lebih benci daripada orang lain. So, uh, ini realiti, saudara sekalian. Dan saya bimbang perkara ini akan membawa ke musibah yang lebih besar pada masa yang akan datang. Kalau tidak ada suatu tindakan yang lebih uh, rasional, lebih terbuka untuk menyelesaikan masalah ini. <tuh> Guru-guru agama yang serbannya besar dan jubahnya besar lahir daripada kumpulan-kumpulan yang selalu uh, terhad pemikiran mereka dan penilaian mereka tentang hidup apa yang diberitahu oleh ustaz-ustaz yang mereka yang mereka walak jadi jenis ini sesekalian membawa kemungkinan musibah besar walaupun di Malaysia hari ini Malaysia dihargai kerana peralihan politik dengan baik tapi kita tidak tahu akan-akan berlaku pada generasi yang akan datang. Yang mereka sibuk dengan game. Mereka sibuk dengan ya mainan dalam internet dan sebagainya dengan telinga tertutup. Dan mereka tak dengar apa. Surah-surah sekalian, ini masa depan yang negatif. Tapi mudah-mudahan kalau kita berperanan dengan lebih yakin dan lebih sedar dan lebih bertanggungjawab saya rasa kita dapat atasi isu ini dengan lebih baik dengan syarat golongan ilmuwan yang betul ya, dapat menjelaskan hakikat sebenarnya perkembangan yang berlaku dalam Malaysia dan kupasan-kupasan Islam yang betul menurut asas-asas pendalilan syarak dan bukan hanya sekadar Ambil satu dua ayat Quran tanpa ya, tanpa berlaku amanah terhadap kaedah-kaedah pendalilan ya, istimbat. Ya. Yang ini kadang-kadang dibuat oleh ulama. Orang ini anggap ulama. Ini sungguh malang. Jadi saudara-saudara sekalian saya tak nak, nak, tak nak bagi penyelesaian. 
Tapi saya kata ini adalah suatu yang menjanjikan suatu yang negatif. Kalau kita semua tak betul-betul menjelaskan kepada masyarakat Islam yang sebenarnya itu apa. Kita kata yang sulit Islam memerintah. Yang disebut Islam memerintah itu apa dia? Parti mana? Adakah parti yang begini begini gini gitu akan itu Islam? Saudara-saudara sekalian, kita tak boleh berfikir secara generalisasi macam generalisasi begitu secara tamim dan itu membahaya kepada masa depan negara. Terima kasih Datuk Bira uh, dan uh, I think jawapannya ialah balik kepada kita semua. We, we have to take the lead. We have to to to, to discuss and to engage more and, and tackle the problems. We are so worried that the the society will be bombarded with the wrong message, wrong teaching of Islam that can make into our country into a dangerous uh, I mean way. Uh, uh, can we have uh, Dr. Daniel to respond? In, in your case, you were mentioning Kashmir, right? About non-state entities. One of the problems with um, CVE is that it's very uh, status quo oriented. Yeah? It's very pro the nation states after the Second World War, the New World Order, uh, as it uh, turned out then. Uh, so there is this concern about um, securitization through CVE. Uh, on another level, there is also the reality or the realization that you can't approach extremism through security means alone. How much did the U.S. spend on um, securitization after 9-11? Can you give me a rough number? It's three trillion U.S. dollars. They realize that they can't go on that way. So this is one of the realizations through CVE. They realize that uh, it can't be uh, done through security means alone. You have to pass it to the community itself. So the resiliency of the community in order to uh, reconcile, to resolve conflicts uh, and whatnot. At the same time, there still is a gray area. Whenever you talk about security and desecuritization, when you talk about CVE, when you talk about counterterrorism, if you develop capacity uh, on the ground, uh, amongst the grassroots, if you develop a strategic communica communication channel from the ground up um, into the state level, you also run the fear of creating a surveillance mechanism for the state. So there's always a concern on my part whenever I talk about CVE, uh, the concern being that uh, there is the tendency to, for governments to potentially exploit or abuse CVE vocabulary uh, to their own ends. I won't mention any cases here because it can be extremely sensitive because of the position of this right now with regards to a certain country. Uh, but, uh, so this grey area, yeah, that we might unwittingly create a surveillance mechanism uh, that uh, might potentially, uh, to a certain extent, um, infiltrate the privacy of uh, individual citizens and whatnot. Uh, what's important in the case of uh, these conflicts, whether it's Kashmir or whether it's Southern Patani or uh, it's, uh, Southern Thailand, uh, Mindanao and so on, is the, the need for that to be uh, oversight. Uh, from civil society organizations and others uh, towards the state. I think this is what is important. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Man sit on noktech and matter shama arz mikwanam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, I will explain three points about the, uh, this issue that had uh, explained by the person from the Kashmir. Three methods is for solving of the takfiri group in the world. I think the first way we can to uh, distinguish between the takfiri group and ordinary group or uh, political group is this 
we thinking that all the people are the same and all the Muslim by the telling the shahadatain are the Muslims, not makes the group of the Muslims in the three, the, in the many parts. All the Muslims, when they tell the shahadatain, the shahadatain makes the Muslims. الان در روی کره زمین یک میلیارد و هفتصد میلیون مسلمان هستند که همه نماز میخونند با فرقه ها و مذاهب و فکرهای مختلف ما همه را یک جا برادران و خواهران دینی خودمون بدونیم First of uh, second things is we, uh, we thinking that all the Muslims in the world are the brother and the unique and is a umma. One part of the Muslims, another part of Muslims is not good. All the Muslims is uh, uh, one unique, and we can to make the uh, uh, good power and potential against the Al-Hadi and Takfiri groups. راهکار دوم این هست که ما معتقد باشیم همچنان که اجماع امت اجماعت الامت و علا ان للمشتهد المصیبه اجران و للمختیه اجران واحد معتقد باشیم که اختلاف نظرهایی که در بین فرق و مذاهب و گروه های عالم اسلام وجود داره تمامی اینها در نزد خدا معذورن و اعمال همشون مورد قبوله If any issues, small issues Suppose in a hands, all the finger is not same, but the, ha the, the hands by the small or big finger, they will do uh, one things. They make and they pick up the some things. If we will thinking the all the Muslims by any differences, are a unique, then we can to do many things and uh, make a very strong potential in the world. و راهکار سوم اینه که ما یه تجربه موفقی در ایران داریم اون تجربه تأسیس مجموعه تقریب که برای شما توضیح میدم تقریب بین مذاهب اسلامی. We have another uh, method. We had done in our country. That is the uh, dialogue between the Muslims. Uh, suppose Sunni or Shia, they can to dialogue with each others. And we had done this test and uh, experience, a good experience in our country about the dialogue between the Muslims in from any branch and any Sunni, Shia, Maliki, Hanbali, Shafi'i and others, Hanafi. ما در تهران مؤسسه مجموعه تقریب مذاهب رو تشکیل دادیم و از 50 کشور جهان اسلام عضو گرفتیم و همه مذاهب علمای مذاهب اسلامی هستند و گفتگوی دوستانه با هم داریم. We have, a orga, uh, we have a big organization in Iran. It's called the Taghrib Mazahib. Taghrib Mazahib is a, uh, they have a uh, target and they have a aim. The aim of the Taghrib Mazahib is a dialogue between the Muslims. And this organization, any time and any uh, in this organization, they uh, make an uh, make a, uh, opportunity for the others, the groups of the Muslim, to make a dialogue to, uh, together. ما کتاب های مذاهب مختلف رو به یکدیگر میدیم تا همه بخونن و با واقعیت های عقایق دی یکدیگر آشنا بشن. All documentation, all documentation from the any branch of the is. Uh, Islam, suppose from the uh, Sunni part and Sunni uh, Shia, they will communicate it with the, to each others to discuss on the uh, documentation of the groups. 
اساتید و عالمان همه مذاهب رو در مؤسسه دعوت میکنیم ایشون عالم شافعی هستن آقای شیخ مصطفی خاتمی من عالم شیعه هستم یا عالم حنفی یا عالم مالکی ما با هم معارف اسلام رو با هم داد و ستد میکنیم و به هم کمک میکنیم for this proof the alim shafi mustafa khatami is here and they can to tell you the about the uh, dialogue between the others the mazahib other the mazahib of the islam با این نزدیک شدن و هم نشستن با هم و گفتگوی با هم و کتاب های هم خوندن بسیاری از اطلاعات غلطی که نسبت اشتباه به مذاهب داده میشه همه فرو میریزه و محبت جای دشمنی رو میگیره I think the dialogue between the مذاهب The first benefit is we can to see each other and we will talk about the issues between the mazahab face to face. And by this face to face talking, we can to solve many issues and problems between the mazahab. Ulama, they can talk and dialogue. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Putri. I'm from Istak IIUM. Uh, my question is, will be very uh, short. Uh, after undergone uh, through, uh, through this uh, de-radicalization process, what's going on is actually the, the data needs will be reintegrated to the society, right? So in, uh, my question is, what is the best way to prepare the society itself um, to integrate all the detainees uh, toward the society itself? The detainees? And, uh, yeah, I mean like people with the extremists. Uh, the extremists. Uh, basically, I think the best example is actually from Indonesia itself. Yeah? Uh, in uh, our discussion with our Indonesian counterparts at uh, JPM a few months ago, uh, what we found out was that in the de-radicalization system um, that's, uh, that's used in Indonesia is that uh, once uh, a detainee uh, has been assessed and uh, has uh, been evaluated and shifted to a non uh, supermax uh, security level in terms of um, the individual um, uh, involved. Uh, we actually, the Indonesian authorities actually allow that person to enroll into TVET program, for example, where they can actually work and contribute uh, the funds from that occupation to family uh, back home. So the idea is to make rehabilitation, even whilst in detention, uh, to involve family and community. I think this is the best way. Uh, so this is a practice that I suppose is, is, is being done in Indonesia. I've been told that it's being done. Um, why it's important? Because um, incarceration itself can be extremely damaging for the family. Um, I can give a personal account of this because a family of, member of mine was um, part of uh, Tantra Fisabilillah many years ago, many decades ago. Uh, and I could see from first hand experience the destruction it brought to the family uh, in terms of divorce, in terms of um, uh, detachment from um, children and whatnot. He was actually sentenced to death, uh, but uh, was pardoned by the young Deputan Agong at that time was the late Sultan of Pahang. Um, so we need to involve uh, family and community in the rehabilitation and the radicalization program, uh, even whilst they are in detention. So this is what we need to do. Um, I think Malaysia is doing a lot uh, of improvements to the system from time to time as well.